So today we are going to study chapter three, okay, lithography. And namely, we are going to study uh, some patent, patent transfer technologies. And uh, please know that MEMS processes can be generally divided into two groups, okay? IC processes and uh, micro-machining processes. IC processes are those uh, fabrication processes developed to fabricate integrated circuits, okay? such as uh, lithography, right? especially photolithography, oxidation, diffusion, ion implantation, right? CVD, right? chemical vapor deposition, evaporation, sputtering, plasma etching, and so on. Okay. We actually will study all these processes later. Okay. And the micro-machining processes are processes specifically developed to fabricate MEMS devices, okay, such as a bulk micro-machining, surface micro-machining, wave bonding, right, DIPA IE, LIGA, LIGA technology, micro-molding, and so on. Right, among all these technologies, right, if we have to pick up the most important one, that will be the photolithography. Okay. Photolithography is a method that transfers the mass pattern. Okay, the mass pattern are typically on the mask, okay, on a device called a mask. Okay. Transfer the mass patterns onto the surface of a solid material, right, typically silicon wafer, using photo method in the light, okay? That's photolithography, okay? And this is the typical flow chart of photolithography process, okay? We start from substrate cleaning, then dehydration baking, right, to remove moisture uh, and water, water molecules, okay? HMDS priming, by spin coating of photoresist, right? Photoresist is a polymer, which is a photosensitive. And then pre-baking, exposure, okay? Some optional post-exposure treatment, then development, discount, and uh, post-baking, okay? We know that the pre-baking is a before exposure, so we call this a pre-baking. But right? this a post-baking is after exposure, right? So we call it post-baking. Then H, and finally, strip PR. Right? PR is an acronym for photoresist. Okay, we remove the photoresist by right? spin coated, right? Uh, previously. Okay, so that's a flow chart of a typical photo lithography process. We can see this is a actually uh, no, pretty complicated procedure. But before we discuss these steps one by one, I'd like to give you a basic idea of photo lithography using a simple example shown in this slide. Assume we have a silicon wafer covered with a, a silicon dioxide layer, okay, this green layer, okay. Then after cleaning, dehydration, baking, and the priming, a photoresistant layer is spin coated and baked, okay. So this is a red layer, uh, stand for a PR layer, okay, photoresistant layer. Okay. Next step is uh, exposure. Okay. Photoresist is a 
selectively exposed with the help of photo mask by UV light. Okay. We know that this photo mask is simply a transparent glass plate with opaque metal patterns. Okay. For example, in this figure, right, this represents an opaque metal pattern. Okay. So the UV light can penetrate everywhere else except this area. Okay. So the photo resist underneath is exposed selectively. Okay. So we can see the photo resist will be exposed right, in these two areas. Okay. But underneath this uh, opaque metal pattern, the photo resist is not exposed. Okay. Any question about the step? And we know that in this step, we use UV light to expose the photo resist. What is a UV light? All right, to answer this question, let's uh, take a look at the the spectrum of electromagnetic wave. Okay, but we know that the horizontal axis is actually uh, the wavelengths. Okay, ranging from 10 to the power of negative 14 meter, very short wavelengths, up to 10,000 meter. Okay, very long wavelengths. Okay, and we can see that the visible light only occupies a very small portion of this spectrum, okay? And the visible light, okay, has a wavelength ranging from about 400 nanometer to about 800 nanometer, okay? From 400 to around 800 nanometer, okay? That's the spectrum of visible light. And we can see that the color around 400 nanometer is a violet, right? Violet color, okay? So for the light whose wavelength or for the electromagnetic wave whose wavelength is shorter than violet, we call it what? We call them ultraviolet light or rays, okay? That's a UV light, okay? UV stands for ultraviolet, okay? So UV light is a light with a wavelength shorter than that of violet, okay? And we can also see that you now the color around 800 nanometer is a, is what? Is a red, right? So for the light whose wavelength is longer than red, we call it what? Infrared, infrared, okay, right. So we have you now both UV light and uh, infrared light. Okay, both of them will be used in men's fabrication, okay. And for exposure, right, we use a UV light, okay. Any question? Then next step is a uh, development, okay. So after exposure, we want to develop the photo resist, okay. In this step, the exposed photoresist is dissolved by a chemical solution called a developer, okay? Right. Now we can see the pattern is transferred from the photo mask to the photoresist, okay? The exposed photoresist, okay, right here, is dissolved, okay? Unexposed photoresist remains, okay? 
Then selective etching, silicon dioxide, okay, that's a green layer, using the patent photoresist as an etching mask. Okay. So silicon dioxide layer is etched except the area underneath the photoresist. Okay. Finally, remove photoresist, right? Strip PR. Okay. So now we can see the pattern is transferred from the photo mask to the silicon dioxide layer. Okay. This is a, a simplified photo desulfate process right, to pattern silicon dioxide or to transfer pattern from the mask to silicon dioxide. Okay. Right. This is a, a 3D illustration which help you to understand the photolithography in a better way. Okay. Right. This is a silicon wafer. It's been coated with a, a photoresist. Okay. So this is a photoresist. Right. This is a silicon dioxide layer. Okay. Then exposure. Right. The photoresist is selectively exposed. Okay. So this uh, is a mask. And this is the opaque metal pattern. Okay. Then development, the exposed photo resist is dissolved. So we can see the pattern is transferred from the mask to the photo resist. Okay. So these two patterns are identical. Okay. Then etching. Okay. Silicon dioxide layer is selectively etched using this uh, photo resist as an uh, etching mask. So the pattern is transferred from uh, the photoresist to the silicon dioxide layer. Okay. So this is a photolithography. Okay. The pattern transfer based on photon. Okay. Based on light. Okay. Next. Let's discuss the steps of photolithography right, in details. Okay. Right, first step is a substrate cleaning. Okay, the first step. Okay. Right, we know that this is a not trivial. Okay. Because the bonding between particles, metal, and the organic contaminations and the substrate is extremely strong. Okay, it's very strong. Some widely used wet chemicals for substrate cleaning. Okay, the first one is uh, called Piranha solution, uh, which is a mixture of uh, sulfuric acid and uh, hydrogen peroxide, okay, five to one ratio. Okay. The temperature is 120 degrees C, okay, so very high temperature for solution. Okay. And uh, this solution is very good at removing organics okay it's very good at removing organics okay by the way do you know what piranha is have you heard of piranha it's a what it's actually a ferocious tropical fish right which is well known for what for attacking and eating live animals so you can imagine that this solution is actually very dangerous. Okay. Right. When you use the solution, you have to be well protected. Okay. Wear a uh, face shield, wear gloves, wear uh, aprons. Okay. Since this is actually a very strong solution. Okay. You have to handle it very carefully. Another solution is called RCA1. Okay, right, this solution is good at uh, removing organics and uh, particles. Okay, and RCA2, okay, which is uh, good at uh, removing metals. Okay, and actually RCA is uh, the name of an old electronic company. Right, it does not exist anymore. Uh, some of you probably 
have seen TVs or radios with a brand name of RCA. Okay, so that's actually an electronic name or electronic brand. Okay, and uh, these two solutions, RCA1, RCA2, that were actually invented by, by this company, by RCA company, by a long time ago. Okay. And the HF, hydrofluoric acid. Okay. Right. This uh, HF is used to remove native oxide, right? because we know uh, HF hatches by silicon dioxide. And uh, we also know that HF is uh, very toxic. Okay, so when you use HF, right, you have to do it in a well ventilated fume hood. Okay, and uh, wear gloves, aprons. Okay, need to be you know well protected. Okay, and the following is a typical cleaning process. Okay, start with the prana cleaning, rings. Okay, RCA one rings. Uh, diluted HF right, to remove native oxide, rings again, and the RCA2. Okay. Right, please know that some MEM processes actually do not need such a high cleanliness. Okay. So then this process can be, this cleaning process actually can be simplified. Right? For example, uh, in many cases, right, product cleaning right, is good enough. Okay. So it can be simplified. Other cleaning methods, okay, for example, maxonic cleaning. Okay, well, this process I use a, uses high frequency acoustic wave or arch sound. Okay, well, this method can be used in conjunction with other chemicals such as RCA1. Okay, and it is very effective to remove particles right, because those are particles can be uh, shaken off mechanically okay, by the mechanical vibration, okay. And there are also some dry cleaning methods, right, such as HF, uh, water vapor cleaning, or UV ozone cleaning, or UV is uh, ultraviolet, okay. So that's uh, the substrate, substrate cleaning. Next, dehydration baking and the priming. Okay, but these two steps are crucial to obtain good adhesion between PR and the substrate. Okay, we know what PR stands for photoresist. Okay, but the temperature necessary to bake out most humidity absorbed on substrate is actually fairly high, right? Which need to be greater than 400 degrees C, okay? But in practice, right, we usually bake the wafer between 100 degrees C and uh, 120 degrees C, okay? And it turns out this is uh, good enough, okay? And the priming, okay? Priming is a step of coating adhesion promoter, the step of coating adhesion layer, okay? Well, if you have ever painted your own house, well, you should know this step very well, okay? Right. Pri uh, priming is actually a critical step, okay? And the most commonly used chemical of priming, okay, for, for MEMS, okay, or to prime uh, photoresist coating okay, is a HMD, HMDS. Okay. Uh, Hexomethyl disilazine, okay, HMDS. A simple way to coat HMDS is to put a wafer or the silicon wafer in a container, then add several drops of HMDS, then HM. Yes, will evaporate and the deposit on the wafer surface. Okay, so it's a very simple setup. Okay, more advanced method is a vacuum priming. Okay, namely both dehydration baking and the priming. Okay, 
the coating of HMDS are carried out inside a vacuum oven. Okay, so there's a more advanced method. Okay. Why, why can HMDS improve the adhesion between photoresist and the substrate? Namely, what's the mechanism of HMDS priming? So let me explain the mechanism using these two figures. Okay. First, before HMDS priming, the silicon wafer or silicon substrate is hydrophilic due to these hydroxy groups, right? Those OH groups. Okay. What does a hydrophilic mean? Well, hydro means what? Water, right? Philic means what? Philic means love, right? So hydrophilic means uh, love water. Okay. So if you put a drop of water on hydrophilic surface, what will happen? Right, the water droplet will spread out and the contact angle will be small. Okay, a low contact angle. Okay. We know that contact angle is this angle, right? The angle between the substrate and the as a tangent line. Okay. So hydrophilic surface has a low contact angle, okay? And after HMDS priming, okay, it becomes hydrophobic, okay? So actually a uh, monolayer of HMDS uh, molecule is formed on the substrate, okay? And then the surface, the second surface converted from hydrophilic to hydrophobic. Phobic means hate, right? So now the surface hates water, okay? Then if you add a drop of uh, water on this uh, hydrophobic surface, by the water droplet, but tends to retain its shape, okay? And uh, the contact angle is large, okay? So hydrophobic surface has a high contact angle, okay? High contact angle compared to hydrophilic one, okay? And the photoresist is a hydrophobic too. Okay. And the hydrophobic material can bond to hydrophobic surface with a good adhesion. So that's the mechanism of HMDS priming. Okay, it converts to a hydrophilic surface to hydrophobic. Then PR can have a good bonding, have a strong bonding, okay, to the substrate. Okay, questions? Sometimes, we actually can make the surface super hydrophobic, right? Namely, the water droplet remains almost spherical on the surface or beads up, okay? And the lotus leaf is a well-known example of super hydrophobic surface in nature, okay? And there are several different ways to make a surface super hydrophobic. For example, we can use nanostructure, microstructure, or the combination of micro and nanostructures, okay? Or hierarchical structure, okay? And the bottom figures, okay? Bottom figures are SEM micrographs of the lotus leaf surface, okay? And we can see that the surface, the lower surface has some um, microstructures, 
or HELOX, okay, which are covered by some nanostructures. Okay. So we can see that the lotus leaf is based on this mechanism, okay, this uh, uh, hierarchical structure. Okay. Let me Okay, let me see if I have the YouTube video. Uh, why is the YouTube video this one? Okay, let me show you a YouTube video, okay? Just a moment. Just a moment. Are you able to see the YouTube video? Yes. Very good. Yeah, okay. We... Let me play. Okay. So a hydrophobic surface is a surface where if you were to put a water droplet on it, it'll beat up. So if you think about um, when you've just waxed your car, water will beat up and kind of roll away. But to create a super hydrophobic surface, you want it to beat up even more. But you can't just do that with a coating like Teflon or a wax. You have to actually put a structure on it. In nature, lotus leaves do this really well. So if you ever look at water beaded up on a lotus leaf, it almost looks like a completely round ball. So what we do in the lab is similar to what we observe on the lotus leaf. We have these structures and we have water sitting on top of them. Super hydrophobic surfaces can be created in a multitude of different ways. Here in our lab, we create rib and cavity structures or we create post structures. The water sits on top of it like a ball, but in addition to that, I have this air cavity in between. What we're seeing is a drop of water falling onto one of these surfaces. As it falls, you can see it starts to spread out as you expect a drop to, but then it starts coming back together again. And you can see that it comes back up off the surface altogether. Here we can see the water jet coming down and hitting the super hydrophobic surface. And as soon as it hits it, the water starts to move outward. But because the water is much more attracted to itself than the actual super hydrophobic surface, it starts to create droplets. Water basically just rolls right off of it. Recently, there have been different products that advertise that they super repel water and you can spray it on your boots and the mud will just roll right away. So the idea of those is they're generally some sort of spray coating. Here at BYU, we have the capability of creating super hydrophobic surfaces. So we aren't just looking at droplets on surfaces, we're looking at flow through surfaces. Some of the applications for these super hydrophobic surfaces include applications on really small scales, chip manufacture, biomedical applications, and then any type of application where you want a clean surface or any application where you might want to reduce the friction drag. Super hydrophobic surfaces are something that will be used in multiple applications in the future. Okay. So we can see that the super hydrophobic surface, the super hydrophobic surface exhibits some very interesting properties and may have some important applications. Okay. Okay, next step, right? Spin coating, right? This is uh, actually the standard method to form thin and uh, 
uniform photo result on wafer. Okay. So first, a small amount of coating material, namely PR, okay, is applied on the center of the silicon wafer. Okay. Then the substrate of silicon wafer is rotated at a very high speed in order to spread the coating material by centrifugal force. Okay. And this results in a thin and a uniform layer of PR. Okay. So this is a spin coating, it's a very simple but effective method to coat uh, photoresist. And the thickness of the PR is mainly determined by these two parameters. First is the viscosity of the photoresist. Okay. Second is the spin speed. Okay. And the thickness is not very sensitive to the spin time, spin duration. Okay. The limitation of spin coding, right? There is a limitation of this method, okay, namely non-uniformity on non-planar surface. Okay. For example, here we have bump. Okay, we have bump here on the wafer surface, and this is the center of the wafer. Then after spin coating, where well, you can expect expect that this plane, this wall facing, right? Facing the center will have uh, more photoresist, more accumulation of photoresist. Okay, much thicker. And uh, the other wall that against the center will have less or no coating of photoresist. Okay, so this uh, is a issue or limitation of spin coating. Okay, how do we address this issue? Well, there are two possible ways. Okay, first is to use a spray coating right, instead of spin coating. Okay, second, we can use a multi layer process where right, spin coat photo results multiple times. Okay. Which made it to uh, a thicker, much thicker photo result. Okay. So after spin coating, we need to bake the photo result. Okay. And this baking is called pre baking. Okay. We, because it's, this is before exposure. Okay, so we got pre-baking. Okay. And the purposes of pre-baking are okay, first, dry off solvent, okay, remove solvent, improve adhesion like between PR and the substrate, and then anneal the stress, okay, anneal the mechanical stress. Okay. And they are three most frequently used baking methods. First one is a called convection oven, is based on convection oven, okay. Which is uh, actually similar to the oven in our kitchen, okay, we use to, you know, bake pizza, okay. Uh, except that in this convection oven, there is a uh, circulating hot air, okay. So this is the first baking method, okay. The second method is based on hot plate, Namely, we simply place the wafer on top of a hot plate, a hot metal plate. Okay. But please know that uh, hot plate baking is a uh, inside out baking. Namely, the bottom surface of the PR is baked first. Okay. This helps to dry off the uh, solvent more effectively. Okay, this is a uh, no, different from convection oven. For convection oven, okay, the top surface of the PI is baked first. Okay. The third method 
is based on infrared IR or infrared we have just introduced uh, a while ago. Okay, infrared stands for uh, light whose wavelength is a uh, longer than red light. Okay, namely longer than one micrometer. Okay, and this figure plots the uh, profile of these three baking methods, okay. Right, this is a hot plate, this is a infrared method, and this is a convection oven method, okay. Know that the horizontal axis is time, okay. So we can see that the hot plate method takes a short time, okay. So actually that's the reason hot plate baking is a widely used in industry, okay. And the typical baking temperature and time, okay. Well, for this pre-baking, we typically use a 90 to 100 degree C for 20 minutes in a convection oven, or 75 to 80 degree C for you no know, 45 seconds or one minute on a hot plate. So the baking temperature is typically less than 100 degrees C, okay. So this step is also called soft baking, okay, because the baking temperature is not that high, okay. So pre-baking is also called soft baking. Next step is uh, exposure. This probably is the most critical step of photolithography. There are three optical lithographic exposure techniques. Okay. Three methods. Okay. First is called contact printing. Okay. We have light source. Okay. And we have this optical system which uh, generates collimated light rays. Okay. And uh, at the bottom, the photo mask is uh, in direct contact with the circuit wafer, uh, with the circuit wafer coated with a uh, PR. Okay. That's the reason we call this contact printing. Okay. The mask is in direct contact with the photo resist or with a certain wafer, okay. Obviously, the disadvantage is what? The disadvantage is that the PR may be scratched by the mask or the mask be scratched or contaminated by PR, okay, due to this direct contact, okay. So that's a, a disadvantage of contact printing, okay. But then people develop this second method, which is called proximity printing, okay. That's uh, very similar to contact printing, except that now the gap there's a gap between the photo mask and the circuit wafer, okay? Right, it's a gap in between, no direct contact, okay? So this is called proximity printing, okay? And the third method is called projection printing, okay? And usually, why this projection system has a reduction factor. For example, if the reduction factor is a 10 to one, then a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter mask, okay, can only produce a one centimeter dye on the wafer, okay, with one exposure, okay. So in order to expose the whole wafer, why the system needs to step and repeat, okay, 
So for this reason, this projection system is typical, typically called reduction step and the repeat system. Or in short, we call it stepper. Okay, stepper. Okay. Right, so totally uh, three exposure techniques. Okay, contact printing, proximate printing, and the projection system or stepper. Okay. The bottom figure, or this bottom figure, shows the emission spectrum of a high pressure mercury lamp. Okay. That's is a, no, that's actually the light source we use. Okay. It's a high pressure mercury lamp. Okay. Some primary wavelengths include G line, okay, 436 nanometer. Okay, this line, this is G line. Okay, H line, 405 nanometer. Okay, this one, around 20 nanometer. Okay, and the I line, 365 nanometer. Okay, the spectrum, the wavelengths. Okay, they are all called uh, UV light, okay, ultraviolet. And please know that there are two types of photoresist, okay? Positive and the negative photoresist, or PR, okay? For the positive PR, okay, the photoresist molecules are decomposed into smaller molecules by the incident UV light. The UV light decomposes the large photoresist molecules into smaller ones. Okay. Then the decomposed PR, okay, right, smaller molecules are dissolved during development. Okay. So exposed photoresist is dissolved. Okay. So for the positive PR, the unexposed area remains. Okay. Exposed dissolved. Okay. So the patterns on the wafer are same as those on mask. Okay. They're identical to the patterns on the mask. Okay. This is a positive PR. Okay. And for the negative PR, okay, the photoresist molecules are cross-linked to larger molecules by the incident UV light. Okay, so UV light okay, cross links photoresist molecules to larger ones. Okay. Then the larger molecules okay, cannot be dissolved. Okay. Small molecules can be dissolved. Okay. Large molecules cannot be dissolved. Okay. So the cross-linked PR are not dissolved during development. Okay. Consequently, the exposed area remains, okay, exposed area where the molecules are cross-linked, okay, remains, okay. So the pattern on the wafer are complementary to those on mask, okay. So that's negative PR, okay. So this slide gives you a comparison of positive and a negative PR. Okay. Any question? Resolution and the depth of focus. Okay. Well, these two uh, very important parameters of the you know, exposure or printing system. Okay. Oh, Teddy, do you have a, do you have a question? No? I don't. I think I might have hit a button or something by accident. Okay. No problem. Okay. I uh, said so you are using the annot annotate function, right? Okay. Yeah, I was looking around. Okay. So let's continue. Okay. Uh, resolution 
is a minimum resolvable or definable feature size. Okay, and then for proximity printers, there's a minimum feature size W minimum is approximately equal to square root lambda g. Okay, and the lambda is a wavelength. Okay, the wavelength. For example, uh, previously we mentioned right, G line, H line, I line, okay, for 36 nanometer or 365 nanometer. Okay. The wavelengths of the UV light used. And the G is the gap between the mask and the wafer. Right? The gap, okay? The gap. For example, Let's say we have lambda of 0.4 micrometer, and g is uh, 10 micrometer. Okay. The distance between the photo mass and the wafer is 10 micron. Okay. Then the minimum figure size that can be defined by the proximity printer will be what? For the four times the ten, which is a what, two micron, okay, right, micron, micron, micron square, and uh, square root, so we'll end up with a micron, okay. So the unit is a uh, right, okay. And uh, we can see that in order to improve the resolution or reduce W minimum, I right, want to define smaller feature. Then we want to reduce G, okay? My G should be smaller, okay? Now I have a question, okay? What is the minimum figure size of contact printing? Okay, how do we calculate the minimum figure size of contact printer? Right, lambda is still the wavelength. Right, of the UV light. So what kind of G should we choose? Should G equal to zero? Yes. Uh, yes or no? Okay. Actually, yes. G, G should be equal to what? So you want to approach zero, right? It's approach zero, but it should be equal to the PR thickness. The thickness of the photo result. Okay, because between the mask and the silicon wafer, there is a thin photoresistor layer, which can be one micron, 0.5 micron, no, something like that. Okay, so for contact printing, G should be the uh, thickness of the photoresist. Okay, and uh, then based on the simple equation. Okay, based on the simple equation, we can conclude that the resolution of contact printer is better than proximity printer, right? Okay, because uh, now G for contact printer is much smaller. Okay, and uh, for contact printer, in order to improve the resolution or in order to reduce the minimum feature size, the photo results should be as thin as possible. Uh, we prefer thin photo results okay, in order to uh, get a better resolution. Okay, so those are the two conclusions. Okay, next let's discuss a uh, projection system. Okay, for projection system, right, the resolution. Now, w minimum, okay, minimum feature size is calculated using a different formula, okay. W minimum is approximately equal to 0.75. Lambda divide, divided by Na, right? Lambda is still the wavelength of UV light, okay. And Na is a numerical aperture of this uh, objective lens, okay. Please know that Na 
is a measure of the ability to gather light of a lens. Okay. And the Na is simply equal to N times the sine alpha. And the N is the refraction index of the media. Okay. And in air, N is equal to what? Right, equal to one, right? The refraction index of air is one. Okay. And the alpha, alpha is this angle. Okay. This kind of collecting angle of the lens. Okay. Right. So based on this formula, okay, how can we improve the resolution? How can we reduce W minimum? Okay. First, we can use a shorter wavelengths. Right. We can choose a light source whose uh, wavelength is shorter. Okay. Or we can choose a lens with a larger NA, with a larger numerical aperture. Right. Namely, we can choose a lens which have a larger curvature or which is thicker. Okay. So this alpha angle is alpha will be larger, right? Okay. However, right, it's obvious that the alpha is less than 90 degrees, right? And no matter how you no, input the lens, right? Alpha is less than what 90 degree. And then sine alpha is uh, less than one. Okay, so the limit. Is there any other way to increase NA? Based on this a simple formula, is there any other way to increase the NA? Uh, if we increase refractive index. Yes, okay, very good. Excellent, okay. And the ref refreshing index of the median, right? And uh, in air, we know N is equal to one. So how can we increase N? We can do the lithography in what? In liquid, right? For example, water, okay? Then N will be greater than one, okay? So N increase, right? Then NA increase, then W minimum decrease, okay? So we can improve the resolution by performing the photolithography in liquid or water. Right, this is actually called immersion, okay? Immersion. Immersion lithography. And actually that's what the industry is uh, using, okay? Right, this is actually uh, fairly straightforward idea, okay, but it actually uh, makes big uh, impact, okay, and uh, the, the engineer, the person who, who invented this technology right, became uh, very rich, okay. Right, so we can see that uh, in many cases, okay, the technology uh, based on common sense, okay, so that's the resolution, okay? Re resolution of projection system, okay? Uh, the next parameter is a depth of focus, right? DOF, okay? The distance along the optical chain, right? Along this line, okay? That the wafer can be moved and still keep the image in focus. So if you have ever taken 
pictures using camera, right? You should know this, uh, this concept very well. Right, for this uh, silicon wafer, okay, we can see that if this uh, thing will move up or move down too much, okay, it will be out of focus, okay, right? Okay. And for this uh, projection system, okay, the depth of focus can be calculated using this uh, formula, right? Sigma is equal to lambda divided by in a square again uh like the resolution okay dof is also determined by the wavelength and the na okay, the numerical aperture okay by right, example g line Okay, what's the wavelength of G line? 436 nanometer, right? Okay, so G line 436 nanometer. Okay, NA the 0.4. Okay, then double minimum. Okay, let's first calculate the minimum video size 0.75 and uh, 0.4. Uh, 36 micrometer, so I convert it nanometer to micrometer divided by Na 0.4. Right, this gives us uh, a resolution of 2.7 micrometer. Okay, let me double check. 0.7, okay, no, my mistake is not this. Okay, it's a typo, it should be 0.82. Eight two, point eight two micrometers. Okay, so that's the minimum feature size that can be defined by this uh, projection system. Okay, now how about depth of focus of the system? Okay, then we simply use uh, this formula. Lambda is a point four three six over point four square, which is a 2.7 micrometer. Okay. So that's a focus is a 2.7 micrometer. Okay. Which means what? Which means uh, surface height variation or surface roughness must be less than 2.7 mic micrometer. Otherwise, the projection will be out of focus. And uh, if we decrease, okay, if we decrease the wavelength and increase the uh, NA to improve the re resolution, okay, for example, I see now lambda is 200 nanometer. And the uh, NA now is uh, two. Then how large is sigma? 200 nanometer over two square, right? So it's what? Only 50 nanometer. Okay. So the surface roughness needs to be less than 50 nanometer. Okay. This is actually a very demanding requirement, okay. And then that's the reason, okay. That's the reason why planarization is a critical step for photo lithography, okay. But in the old days, right, people used spin on polymers or glass right, to planarize the surface. And sometimes uh, edge back can be used to you know, planarize 
the surface. Right, this is uh, this top layer. Okay, you know this top layer is uh, the spin-on photoresist or glass layer. Okay, and uh, this layer is a uh, etched back. Okay, then the bottom surface, right, this is the original surface. Okay, which is pretty rough. Now is a uh, planarized. Okay. But we can see that right, this mass only provides a limited degree of planarization. Okay. And a much better method is based on chemical mechanical polishing, CMP. Namely, we just use a polishing pad, a rotating polishing pad, polishing pad to mechanically polish the wafer surface, okay? So again, we can see this is a very simple idea, okay? This is a straightforward idea, but uh, obviously um, the control of polishing head need to be very accurate, okay? So to realize this idea or to implement this idea is not trivial. It needs a lot of engineering efforts. Okay. This figure, this SEN image is a cross sectional view of an Intel chip okay, made by Intel. Okay. We can see that it contains uh, totally seven metal layers M1, M2, to M7. Okay. And we can see that every metal layer is planarized. Oh, it's polished, okay? It's polished by CMP, okay? So CMP or planarization is a critical step, okay? especially for submicron technology, okay? Right, Photolithography right, cannot be carried out successfully without uh, planarization.